Welcome to Snake Bros Kids. In this video, we will be digging into the basic geology of our planet. Have you ever gazed across the landscape and wondered how the hills and valleys came to be? Or held a beautiful rock in your hand and pondered the forces that led to its existence? If so, you may be curious about geology. To begin our journey, we look to another curious person, German scientist Alfred Wegener. Wegener's relentless research led to major breakthroughs in the field of geology. His hypothesis that the continents once fit together like puzzle pieces was presented in 1912 and was fully developed in his 1915 publication, The Origin of Continents and Oceans. He said that his revolutionary idea came to him upon studying the map of the world and that he was impressed by the congruency of both sides of the Atlantic coast. It was not until the 1950s that his observations would become more widely accepted and that a new understanding of the dynamics on our planet would be built upon his precursor theory to plate tectonics. So contemplating rocks can expand our understanding of the planet, but what exactly is geology? Geology is the study of the earth, with geo coming from the Greek root for land, earth, or soil. Geologists are concerned with the rocks of which the earth is composed and the processes by which they change over time. Geology can be used to understand the structure of the terrestrial realm in which we all reside, as well as the processes driving change deep beneath our feet. Like the layers of your favorite dessert, the structure of earth can be visualized as a series of layers that each have a role to play in maintaining earth's integrity. At times, the dynamics between these layers are what initiate geologic change. The mixture of gases that make up the first layer of the planet is known as the atmosphere, or simply what we call air. Also present all around us are the ever-transforming cycles of water that can be grouped together in the next layer known as the hydrosphere. Once at the terrestrial level, the outermost solid shell of the planet is known as the crust. The crust can be subdivided into the continental crust, which forms the land of the continents, shorelines, and shallow seas, and the oceanic crust, which consists of the uppermost portion of the tectonic plates. Together, the crust and rigid part of the upper mantle form the lithosphere, which acts as an elastic layer over the course of thousands of years. At the seams of tectonic plates, new crust is continually being created by magma pushing up from the mantle material below. The plates gradually push away from each other by molten hot crystal injections that are then chemically modified by the cooling of the seawater. In this rock forming process, the youngest oceanic rocks can be found nearest the ridges, while older rocks can be found farther away. Also in this layer is a mechanism for recycling rock as instabilities in weight and temperature lead to subduction zones where one plate sinks below the other. As we continue descending, the molten crystal involved in crust building can be found in the next layer known as the asthenosphere. The asthenosphere consists of melting rock, making it relatively weak compared to the more rigid upper mantle. This ductile layer contains the most important source of magma for rock creation and tectonic movement. An important transition zone exists next, where rocks do not melt or disintegrate, but tend to linger and become more dense. The most intriguing characteristic of this transition zone is its abundant storage of water. As much water exists locked up in crystals in this zone as does exist in all the oceans. However, unlike the states of matter that most are familiar with, water in this zone exists as a hydroxide, or an ion of hydrogen and oxygen with a negative charge. The hydroxide becomes trapped in the crystalline structures of rocks and can only escape when the crystals encounter high enough heat and pressure at the bottom of the zone. The lower mantle contains the bulk of Earth's volume. This high pressure zone is the prime location for molecularly transforming iron bearing minerals. The main constituents of the lower mantle are polymorphic rocks, meaning that they are in a liminal stage on their way to having different crystalline structures and exist more as hosts for iron. These rocks are mostly unstable on Earth's surface, except as rare inclusions in natural diamonds and meteorites. 
At the center of the earth, we find the core, which can be divided into a liquid outer core and a solid inner core. The outer core is composed of mostly iron and nickel, and the churning motion of this liquid metal helps create Earth's magnetic field. The inner core is primarily a ball of iron under immense heat generating pressure. Although it is not accessible to direct measurement, information about the inner core is mostly deduced from measuring seismic waves. So how do the dynamic layers of Earth result in the rock-strewn landscape we see around us? We have mentioned several factors that drive rock formation, including heat, pressure, and water, but let's take a look at what creates the three main groups of rocks, sedimentary, igneous, and metamorphic. In the case of sedimentary rocks, defining what sediment is will help us better understand the formation of this rock. Sediments are mineral grains, organic matter, or chemical precipitates that are transported through the natural processes of weathering and erosion and then settle in a new location. Sediments are most often transported by water, but wind and glaciers can also contribute. If many layers of sediment accumulate or a large deposition occurs, the material has the potential to begin compacting and cementing, taking on a new crystalline structure altogether. From sandstone, limestone, gypsum, chert, coal, and many more, the majority of our landscape is formed by a veneer of sediments that have fused together. Important natural resources such as fossil fuels, drinking water, salt, and valuable ores can be found in sedimentary formations. Igneous rock is formed by the cooling and solidification of molten material. The majority of igneous rocks are known as intrusive, meaning that the magma slowly cooled within the Earth's crust. The pre-existing rock surrounding the intrusion acts as an insulator, allowing the rock to form its characteristic coarse grains during the slow cooling process. Batholiths are a recognizable form of an igneous intrusion, and granite and diorite are two common types of intrusive igneous rock. Extrusive igneous rock undergoes its cooling process much more rapidly above the Earth's surface. The magma that is forced up through the Earth's surface quickly solidifies, lending itself to the formation of the fine grains found in rocks such as andesite and basalt. Unique shapes can be formed by the cooling and contracting of these rocks, such as in the case of polygonal basalt columns at the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland. In some cases, the molten rock cools so quickly that atoms are unable to arrange themselves in a crystalline structure, resulting in volcanic glass such as obsidian. Finally, we come to the aptly named metamorphic rock, which can transform from an existing type of rock, including the sedimentary and igneous rocks that we have already discussed. In the transformation process, the original rock, known as the protolith, is subject to profound heat and pressure, Hot fluids circulating through pore spaces can dissolve existing minerals and precipitate others, while crystals can resize and reorganize, resulting in a new texture and composition. Unlocking the mysteries held within rocks is a pursuit humanity has always been captivated by, and we hope that this fascination continues with you. Thanks for watching! What major geologic concept about the Earth's crust did Alfred Wegener's observations lead to? Plate tectonics. What elastic layer of the earth is formed by the crust and part of the upper mantle? Lithosphere. What type of rock is formed by the cooling and solidification of molten material? Igneous.